All right, folks, thank you very much for joining us for our press briefing with regard to what the state is doing to manage the spread of coronavirus here in Nebraska. And as always, we want to remind people to continue to practicing our social distancing, keeping that six feet away from you and other people when you go out in public, wear a mask when you go to the store, wash your hands often. If you see a crowded bar or restaurant, it's a great opportunity to turn around and go to another bar or restaurant. Remember, it's really going to be those enclosed spaces where you're uh, next to somebody else um, that is going to help spread the virus, and those are uh, great times to wear masks. So uh, all of these things that we have done have been to slow the spread of coronavirus in our state and ultimately preserve our hospital capacity. And, you know, this is just a, another key point is that, look, this is a virus. We cannot stop it, but we can slow it enough to preserve our hospital capacity, and we've done that very, very successfully here in Nebraska. Uh, We've always been able to provide that hospital bed, that ICU bed, or that ventilator to anybody who has needed it when they've needed it. And currently in the state of Nebraska right now, our hospital capacity is at 37%. Our ICU bed capacity is at 34%, and our ventilator capacity is at 83%. Another great way people can help fight the coronavirus is by taking advantage of testnebraska.com. This is a great way to get tested if you're going to go, say, see a relative or something like that, and you, don't want to, you want to make sure you're not spreading the virus. Great opportunity to go to testnebraska.com, sign up, and then you can start looking to schedule yourself for a test. We're, we've got no restrictions with regard to getting that test uh, scheduled uh, other than just the availability, and we've got lots of availability, so please look at that, testnebraska.com. We have delivered over 240,000 tests through testnebraska.com, and 350, over 357,000 people have signed up through testnebraska.com. So please consider testnebraska.com. Uh, one of the things that we have received questions on has been with regard to vaccinations. Now, the federal government has asked us to have our plan for distribution of vaccinations by November 1st, and so we are working on our plans for distributing vaccinations. Um, and one of the questions we get is, will this be a mandate that we have to have, that somebody has to have a vaccination? And I hope that people have really observed how we've approached this whole pandemic to explain people what the rules were and how they can best slow the spread of the virus. But we did not do a shelter in place order. We did not do a mask mandate. We will not be doing a vaccine mandate either. Now, we certainly encourage people to get vaccines. Um, here in Nebraska, just overall, pre-pandemic, we were, I think, Wallet Hub rated us the number nine state for people getting vaccines. So we want people to get those vaccinations. Uh, and we want to encourage that use as well for the coronavirus, but we're not going to be mandating that. All right, so we have a number of guests that are going to be with us here today. Uh, first of all, we're going to have our managed care organizations or the managed care health plans that manage our Medicaid system. Uh, come and talk a little bit about how they've been impacted uh, during the pandemic. Specifically, we're going to have Tim Myers, who's the plan president for um, uh, WellCare Nebraska, which is a uh, Anthem company. And he's also the president of the Nebraska Medicaid plans, right? You're the president of that organization. So Tim will be talking first. And then we're going to have uh, Angie Ling, who is our incident commander for the Department of Health and Human Services. Some of you may remember her uh, in a different role a little bit earlier when she was major Ling with the Nebraska National Guard. And Angie, thank you very much to your service, for your service to our state and to our nation. We appreciate that. Uh, but she was also doing a lot of the testing. So this is a, a great fit for us to be able to have Angie in the Department of Health and Human Services. And so uh, she's going to be talking about the Nebraska Accommodation Project, and we'll get to more of that in just a minute. And then uh, Gina Ewing with the Elkhorn Logan Valley Health District will be here, as well as Matt Bloomstead, our Commissioner of Education, talking about some of the additional flexibility we're giving schools with regard to how to um, uh, quarantine or manage kids with masks uh, and how that relates to schools and so forth. So we'll be doing a little bit of that first. But um, before we get into that, uh, we will go ahead and start with the... Um, uh, with Tim Myers, who, uh, as I mentioned, is the association uh, or the pre plan president uh, for well care and also the president of the Nebraska Medicaid Health Plans. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Tim. All right, uh, thank you, Governor Ricketts. Uh, it's an honor to be here today. 
to reconfirm our commitment to delivering the leadership, resources, and supports that are needed to keep pace with Nebraska's emerging priorities and to evolve the health of communities. The ongoing healthcare crisis has definitely left many feeling unsettled, but it's inspiring to see that the Nebraska Association of Medicaid Health Plans, the Division of Medicaid and Long-Term Care, our healthcare provider partners, and our legislative leaders come together to make strategic decisions in fiscal allocation, as well as to implement innovative actions so that Nebraskans receive consistent and exceptional care. I'm particularly proud of the actions taken by the Nebraska Association of Medicaid Health Plans, that's the collabor collaborative that I represent, which has made a positive impact on more than 240,000 Nebraskans we serve. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the association has worked tirelessly to put our Medicaid health plan members first and to simplify health care for everyone. We work to streamline existing processes and encourage telehealth innovation so that our members have additional options for receiving care. We also have stepped up our educational and outreach efforts to ensure members have the tools they need to access their benefits. We offered more, more benefits, rewards, and resources, because during trying times, health should not be neglected. It remains a top priority. The association has also taken extraordinary strides over the past few months to be especially supportive of our healthcare provider partners. We continue to be in close daily contact so we understand the needs and offer supports that make it easier to serve our members during these unprecedented times. Whether the need is for financial supports, technology tools, or even relief from administrative burdens, we're listening and making resources available to help. And we did, just didn't keep our own members and provider partners in mind. We made sure our supports continued to extend to the entire communities. Community outreach and advocacy efforts went on, regardless of the many efforts that have been halted by the pandemic. To this day, we continue to contribute needed supplies throughout the communities. We still, we're still supporting fundraisers, we still host baby showers, and we remain available as a resource to all who need us. This is all possible because we have been agile and innovative in pivoting to new safe methods of connecting with our communities and stakeholders. Zoom, virtual outreach, and social distancing have become our new normal, but we're making it work. And we continue to meet the ongoing needs of our members, stakeholders, and communities. Our support for the governor's successful COVID-19 testing and tracking efforts will continue, as will our, uh, our annual vaccination efforts for the upcoming flu season. We also look forward to welcoming Nebraskans who will become eligible to receive life-changing healthcare supports through our new Medicaid expansion program. Thanks to our legislative efforts and statewide support of this new program, we will have the opportunity to improve the health outcomes and potentially save thousands of lives across our state. It is a responsibility that the association takes very seriously, and we're confident that this program will redefine what is possible in our, for our state's future health. In all, we continue to evolve to meet changing needs and challenging circumstances, but most importantly, our commitment to collaboration is stronger than ever. Thank you, Governor Ricketts, and your administration for your leadership during this time of crisis. Together, we continue to lift up those in need and build a better, stronger, and healthier future for all of Nebraska. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Tim. And uh, we are also being joined not only, not only by WellCare and Anthem Company, but also our other two providers that we have here in the state, uh, Nebraska Total Care and United Healthcare. Their CEOs and CMOs are sitting here in the audience as well, so thank you very much for joining us. We very much appreciate all the work that you do pre-pandemic, now with the pandemic, to be able to take care of Nebraskans. And uh, a couple points just to build on what Tim said. Uh, he, uh, he talked about flu vaccinations, so good idea to get your flu vaccination. Those doses, I understand, are being distributed right now, like places like Walgreens and so forth have them. And that uh, talking to my chief medical officer, Dr. Antone, they do want a certain period of separation between getting the flu vaccine and getting the coronavirus vaccine when that's available. So get the flu vaccine early is a, is a great choice to make right now. So that would be one thing. And then the other thing, as you mentioned, Medicaid expansion, Again, the enrollment period began August 1st. Coverage begins October 1st. So if you haven't enrolled and you're eligible, that would be a great opportunity for that too. So there you go. See, Tim, I just plugged you. All right, so next, uh, we're gonna talk a little about the Nebraska Accommodation plot, uh, Project. 
So this was a project that we put in place at the beginning of the pandemic as part of our six pillars for how we're supporting our hospital system. So again, just to cover those quickly, there's the testing to find out who is positive. And uh, then of course the goal is to uh, find, uh, make sure they stay home and isolate. Then you've got the contact tracing to find out who all they've been in contact with to get those people to quarantine. And then we talked about the personal protective equipment, which the state has been buying and distributing through our local public health departments to first responders and, and healthcare workers and long-term care workers and so forth. And then the fourth pillar was that place where people can go, that housing. And this is where the accommodate, Nebraska Accommodation Project comes in. And just for, if you're wondering what the, the last two were, uh, we had our plans that we put in place around things like long-term care facilities and, of course, our directed health measures. Those are, that completes out the six pillars we had to support our hospital capacity. But that number four there has to do with the housing and allowing uh, people to find a place to go uh, where they can be safe uh, so that they aren't infecting somebody else or being infected by somebody else. So, for example, we opened this up to our healthcare workers, our first responders. We did it for uh, meat processing workers. We did it for the general public. And now um, uh, Angie is going to come up, Angie Ling is going to come, who is our incident commander again in the Department of Health and Human Services, is going to talk about the program we have for teachers and um, uh, which worked in combination with Z Winfrey, did a lot of work on this as well. So we want to give Z a, a shout out there for all her great work. She's been doing great work throughout this entire pandemic as well. Oh, don't be embarrassed. She's sitting here in the audience. I, so I wanted to give her a shout out. But Angie, can you come up and talk to us a little about the Nebraska Accommodation Project and how we will work with teachers? Thank you, Governor Ricketts. Good afternoon. Today I'd like to introduce the newest branch of the Nebraska Accommodation Project, which originally started in April. The school staff branch of the Accommodation Project is a partnership between the Nebraska Department of Education and the Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services. The Nebraska Accommodation Project, which is also known as NAP, is designed to allow a person exposed to COVID-19 to quarantine themselves away from a high-risk individual in their household. They will help protect families and reduce the spread of COVID-19. To qualify for this program, you will need to be a resident of Nebraska, employed by any school in Nebraska, physically working on campus and directly with children every day. Additionally, a full-time member of your household must have a high-risk medical condition and you must have a documented exposure to COVID-19. In order to receive this benefit, you need to apply online at dhhs.ne.gov. Placement will be at a local hotel, usually within 40 minutes, and your stay is likely 14 days or until conditions may change. There will be no charge to the school staff for this service and approved applicants are usually placed within 24 hours. Z Winfrey has done a great job getting this program up and running and we are happy to offer this to our school staff. If you have any additional questions, you can always reference the website dhhs.ne.gov and look at the NAP section and it'll give you a lot more details. That's all I have. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Angie, appreciate it. And again, so similar in the vein, if you've got somebody at home who has one of those uh, underlying healthcare conditions, you don't want to infect that person. If you've been exposed, we have the opportunity to be able to make sure that you've got a place to go so that we can reduce that risk of transmission. So thank you very much, Angie, and thank you, Z, for all your work in the setup. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and um, uh, bring up our next topic, which is going to be around schools. So that was a good lead in, right? Somebody's thinking and planning and putting us all together. Good job, Taylor. I don't know where you went, but you did a good job pulling us all together. All right, so next, uh, I'm gonna bring up Gina Ewing, who is the health director at the Elkhorn Logan Valley Public Health District. And she's gonna talk a little bit about uh, the new DHM or some of the adjustments we made to the DHM with regard to uh, school kids and quarantining and self-monitoring and that sort of thing. So with that, Gina, I'm gonna ask you to come up and uh, give us a few words about that. Good afternoon. Thank you, Governor, for the opportunity to come before Nebraskans to provide some updates on behalf of the Nebraska Association of Local Health Directors and Nebraska's local public health departments. We all know that schools play a vitally important role in every child's life by providing education, socialization, as well as critical support and safety net services for students and families. Over the summer, Nebraska's public health departments spent countless hours with school officials 
and the Nebraska Department of Education in preparation for school reopening this fall. These planning discussions always centered around two major goals, to resume education for the children of Nebraska and to keep students and staff reasonably safe from COVID-19 exposure and spread. Our knowledge about COVID-19 spread, mitigation, and prevention is constantly changing. We are watching things locally since the school year began. We have continually updated our public health interventions with goal of protecting our students and communities. Since school started one month ago, local health departments have seen a variety of COVID-19 cases among both students and staff. Each case has unique details and has been handled on a case-by-case -case basis across Nebraska. The governor's updated state-directed health measure, state phase four, provides additional clarity in how local health departments across Nebraska will be assessing risk and exposure and applying quarantine and isolation orders for school-aged children. Please note that schools can use stricter CDC guidance if they choose, but the minimum expectation is outlined in the health measures that are signed in current today. Again, the goals are to keep students in school while min minimizing virus spread. In order to accomplish that, the most important policies that schools can enact in order to drastically reduce exposures in school that result in quarantine continue to be to require face coverings that cover both the nose and the mouth, to enforce strict six-foot social distancing, and to utilize seating charts so that contacts can easily be traced. When a child initially tests positive for COVID-19, there are many elements to contact tracing. The process starts with an interview of the parent, and if the student is old enough to provide reliable information, the student is interviewed as well. The parent and or the student are essential in identifying their contacts both inside and outside of the school, and being forthcoming with this information is key to successful and timely contact tracing. There is a common misunderstanding where the physical premises of the school is assumed to be the only logical point of contact among our younger population. However, students frequently identify their classmates as outside of school unmasked exposures resulting from social gatherings, riding in vehicles together, and other settings. Once the outside of school contacts are identified, public health department staff work with the respective schools to determine school-related contacts. This includes both classroom and extra extracurricular exposures. And the biggest change with the directed health measures that are before us today is considerations for those exposures and possible ability for schools to allow students back in school even after an exposure. Again, exposures are gauged based upon mask wearing, adherence to social distancing, whether the exposure was outside, inside, or both, and then the estimated length of the exposure. Throughout the process, local health departments remain committed to working closely with school districts in their jurisdictions. We will continue providing guidance on preventing the spread of the virus that can keep students and families safe. This is a responsibility that none of us take lightly. The well-being of Nebraskans is our top priority. It was one year ago that I stood in the rotunda and gave a presentation to kick off Public Health Week after the floods of 2019. The message then was, if I'm ever stuck in a disaster as a public health worker, I pray that it happens in Nebraska. Being surrounded by the best public health colleagues is the safest place in the world. They don't strive to be heroes, they just are. It is truly a privilege to stand among the best colleagues. Not only are they Nebraska strong, but they're public health strong as well. Thank you. I'm gonna turn it over to Matt Bloomstead, the Commissioner of Education. Yeah, and thanks, thanks, Gina. And, and one of the one of the things that also has prepared, I think, a lot of us is those past experiences, and we continue to learn, continue to learn about really what makes a difference in these cases. And I uh, appreciate the partnerships that we do have across the state. I think our school districts. It's not always easy. I mean, I'll just be honest. There's tension that that comes in these times. It's hard to be able to pull everyone together. 
but pull in the same direction. Well, our real goal is keeping kids in school, as Gina mentioned. It's really important that, that, that folks understand what does mitigate the risks of spread of, of the coronavirus and that we continue to do that work in partnership. We continue to lay out guidance from the Department of Education, from our health directors, from the state. It's really important that folks understand that there's a personal responsibility that comes with this as well. So when we talk about the important the importance of masking, the importance of social distancing, it's important that we are modeling that in schools. And so I think the new DHM actually allows us to even, even further model that, um, exploring that uh, and explaining to folks that the importance of masking as part of the quarantine process, part of the contact tracing process is absolutely critical. So, so thanks for all of those particular efforts. Thanks really to our school districts and our parents and our students that are, that are managing this as well. And I think what we're starting to see, and it is a great place to have have a crisis, I guess, Nebraska, where we can all work together. I think that's what I heard Gina say in not so many words, but the, the, the reality is we are really having to work together to make sure that we can manage this. In the end, um, it, back to those personal responsibilities, things the governor just had mentioned too about getting flu shots and other things, that's part of the responsibility and part of the communication that will continue to come through our schools, through our local health departments, through the state. It'll be important that we continue to do that in order to maintain the school environment that we have. And again, I, I would even thank uh, and uh, Z's here. She got so much attention. So Z, I'm going to thank you also for the accommodations project and Angie and the governor. That the reality is finding different ways that we can continue to work together to make sure that we're able to maintain school environments, which which helps us overall. So I'm very I'm very pleased to uh, be at this moment in time where we're weeks into the school year. We haven't seen too much of a of spread that what is happening within schools. That means our protocols are working. Again, as I said a couple weeks ago, staying the course, keeping those protocols in place, you know, not really letting up on those protocols. We're watching the data. If we see that we have room to do something a little bit better and the data proves that we can, we'll do that. If we see that something's not working as well, we're going to be in there um, uh, making adjustments as, as we continue to go. And I would just lastly say, really what happens in our schools, we're finding a routine. And I know it's been really difficult for school leaders and teachers to find the best way to provide educational opportunities, but we're kind of getting there. I'm starting to feel a sense across the state of, of comfort in, in what's taking place. And again, people can stick to that, continue to do that, and that's going to be to the benefit of our students. And hopefully, as we continue to go, make it through this school year, we know we're going to have to live with it. I think I've heard the governor say that just more than once or several times over here as, uh, at these press events. But the reality is that's very true. We, we're going to keep pressing forward and, and keep making that, that progress and committed to, to making this work for our, school, for our school year and for our kids. Thanks. All right, thank you very much, Commissioner Bloom said. So I think uh, the way Gina said it was a little bit better if I could just, like, I, I'm not looking to have a crisis in Nebraska, just so you know. But, you know, if we have to go through challenging times, this is a great place to do it. I think Gina said it better, so thank you, Gina. Uh, and again, I, I, Commissioner, safe to say, successful opening to the school year, yeah, right? Really so, yeah, so very, so I think you're right. The steps schools have taken have worked, and it has been a successful opening of the school year. And Gina, if I can just briefly highlight kind of the high level change in the DHM, it essentially says if the child who is positive is masked and the other children they're around is masked, then those other children don't have to quarantine, they have to self-monitor. And what that difference is, is they, if, as long as they're wearing masks, they can go back into the classroom. That's fundamentally correct, right? Yeah, that's correct. Now, and the, the difference would be that if either party is unmasked, then they are going to have to quarantine. Is that, is that fair? Yes. Yeah, okay, so that's fair. So I got it right. So again, folks, that's kind of what we're doing is giving some more flexibility for schools to be able to keep the kids in the classroom. Again, the, the big caveat here is wearing masks. So uh, thank you very much, Gina. I appreciate, appreciate, appreciate you being here, and you, you all stay on tap here, because now we're going to move into questions and answers. And Taylor, where'd you go? Oh. There you are. Uh, do you want to uh, give me the questions that were texted in? A couple of questions. Don Walton is asking, um, what is your MC telling you about what to expect from the virus um, in the coming months? And do you urge Nebraskans to get vaccinated once the vaccine is So Don Walton's like, what is UNMC telling you about the coming months? And do we encourage people to get vaccinated? Yeah, I think that uh, there's really no new news here from the standpoint of we know we're going to have to manage this virus the coming months, and that 
when we do have a vaccine, we encourage people to get vaccinated. The federal government will have a priority on who's gonna get vaccinated. Um, we'll have more information on that down the road, but you can imagine it'll be, it'll be things like healthcare workers and first responders and people who are in those vulnerable categories. So there will be a process uh, to that, but we certainly encourage people to get the vaccination. Andrew Zaki asks, correction staff members currently not being able to work because they have tested positive for coronavirus is now at 68. Does that concern you? Um, the Inspector General says that we have potentially have an issue with the state plan where 24 staff have tested positive. At what point does it become a crisis? So Andrew Zaki is asking him uh, with regard to uh, our corrections department and 68 people testing positive, 24 at the Nebraska State Penitentiary. And this is a situation that we're just managing. So Director Frakes has got a plan put in place. You probably saw some of those steps uh, earlier with regard to some of the things he's done with regard to our correction system. And we'll just continue to manage this just like every other organization in the state has to do. And actually that's a, a good segue for one of the things that I encourage all businesses to do is have your own plan to make sure that you're managing the coronavirus here. I know that many of our stores have had to have that already, but every business should have a plan as you're allowing people to come back to work and work in the office setting, you should have a plan with regard to how you're gonna manage the coronavirus. All right, so that was it? All right, so questions from here in the audience. So the question uh, is, is it up to the state to mandate a vaccine and are different states making different decisions? And I, again, this is relatively new from the standpoint of, you know, specifically with regard to this pandemic. Uh, in Nebraska, we're not gonna be making a mandate. Uh, Commissioner Bloomstead, uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, what's the policy with regard to vaccines in schools and is there an application here for that? Do you wanna come up and talk about that? And, and we have just started conversations about what that might look like as a vaccine becomes available, but there are requirements for vac vaccination for, for students as they enter school. You know, all the typical measles, mumps, rubella, those types of things. And so we're really looking at what those protocols should look like as it relates to the coronavirus and, and hoping we can model that. But I would just add, Fred's asking if there's a, is a matter of policy or a matter of, but for current, current requirements are actually within law. And so it might be an important conversation that we'd also have in the legislature from the school perspective anyway, but. Yeah. So to answer your question though, as a matter of policy, I am not gonna mandate it. But as you can see, uh, we have statutes that require the other vaccine. So as the commissioner said, it may be a legislative issue. Uh, so, right, there are, I don't, I am not aware of any general vaccination requirements, Dr. Antone. Nope, there are no uh, vaccination requirements for the general population. Okay, so you're, still, yeah. you're saying that's going to continue to be the case? Or that will continue to be the case. Schools are a different issue with regard to what the commissioner said, and um, they're beginning to have those conversations right now. Okay. Martha. So Martha's asking what my thoughts are about the Jake Gardner situation, and I think we can just describe the whole thing in one word, tragedy. It's a tragedy for James Skurlock, it's a tragedy for Jake Gardner, and uh, you know, I encourage Nebraskans to pray for all the families involved. So that was, the question was, do I believe the case should be turned over to a grant, should have been turned over to a grand jury? And that was obviously uh, Don Klein's decision to do that. That's, uh, you know, it's his, it's his decision to make that. Other questions? Yeah, Martha? operations with 
this number of staff people out either isolating or quarantining? So the question was, how is the Department of Corrections managing with uh, the number of people that are out isolating or quarantining? And again, Director Franks had a plan in place for this long before the pandemic on how to handle these types of emergencies. And we're just continuing to work the plan. You've seen some of the steps he's taken to be able to manage it with regard to limiting access to people to be able to come into the Department of Corrections and so forth. So uh, we're just going to continue to manage it. And, you know, we'll, you know, for security purposes, we don't divulge the details of that plan. But uh, we'll just continue to manage the plan. Another question, Commissioner Bloomstead. Commissioner Bloomstead, good thing you stay in handy. Yes, I'm handy, yeah. yeah. You emphasize that you're watching the data to help determine your policies. What do the data show? How many kids have gotten sick? How many teachers have gotten sick? School staff members statewide. Yeah, it, as far as when we're, and I don't know that I have all the data, so Fred asked, you know, as we're watching the data, how many total students, how many total staff. We've actually really created an environment where that's being uh, mostly managed at the local health department with our school districts. Many school districts are standing up kind of transparency of what those, those numbers look like. But what I've been really interested in in watching the data is what cases are actually being spread in schools um, to try to adjust that. And really, we've only had one kind of significant event where, where something happened in acquire and that seemed to be the one source of that spread we're going to continue to work with HHS in fact I appreciate Angie and others as they're kind of ramping up at HHS to look at data at a at a scale level I know Dr. Anton and I've kind of looked at that as well um, but most of the cases have actually been coming if they've been discovered that they are students or staff that they haven't been spread within schools and that's been the important part for us Um, I think that was one that was widely reported at the time in, in um, Pavilion La Vista, so. Thank you, Commissioner. And Governor, on yeah. the hotel program, uh, who's paying for it and how much? So the, the question was, with the Nebraska Accommodation Project, who's paying for it? We're using CARES Act money to pay for it. How much will it cost? Uh, Angie, do you happen to have any figures on what the previous iterations or Z? What? So the initial monitor. Z, do you want to just come up here and get a little FaceTime? Since we've been talking, we've mentioned you a couple times now. You might as well come up and, and have the, uh, you know, the glory of being up front here and, because we've been telling about what a great job you've done on this Nebraska Accommodation Project. So they might as well see the face behind it. You may recognize also that Z has been here before when we're doing our Spanish language broadcast. And I am no more comfortable in English than I am in Spanish, so <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> My name is Zee Winfrey, and I have the honor of working for the Department of Health and Human Services for Nebraska. I was one of the first people to start and run with the accommodations project, so that's why I get the pleasure of answering a couple of questions for you guys. Very glad and very grateful for Angie to come and lead us forward as we carry on. The original iteration of NAP, as we affectionately call it, was averaging from beginning to end that first run. We were less than $500,000 and most of that was for our isolation staff. Because we were caring for people that were either symptomatic or had tested positive, we wanted to make sure that they had around the clock medical care and the cost of that medical staff and the equipment that we provided just in case they needed something, we were able to provide it instantly for them was the largest part of that. Um, so it was predominantly staffing. We were able to aggressively negotiate all of our rates for the sites, for the hotel rooms. All of Nebraska has stood up to help each other. Every hotel owner has come forward and said, I have rooms and I will give it to you at an amazing rate because I want these people to be safe. I want their loved ones to be safe. So the price point for NAP has been ridiculously low compared to how much good we've actually done. If you wanna just throw some ballpark numbers around, for every one person that we keep safe and sound in a hotel, we're sparing 10 infections. And if, you, if we can get some specific details with regard to the specific hotel aspect cost of that, right? Yes. So we can get that for you, we just don't have it off the top of the head. We didn't break it down. We just have the total and then as we go forward, we're trying to stick to that same um, per room, per night fee. So are there projections? I mean, is there maybe a 10 times as many teachers as uh, healthcare workers? Or 
So the first round, and all of this is still available to the same population, we've only added educators. So the first round was healthcare workers, any first responders, so fire, police, um, correction facility officers, meatpacking plant professionals, and so we catered to a huge population in the hotels, and then we opened it up to anybody that's a resident of Nebraska. So the addition of the educators is not going to be such a large addition that it would quadruple or even double what the projected expense was of the original. We just want to make sure that we provide educators the opportunity to safely quarantine and continue to provide that lifeline for children in their future. But I will absolutely get you the figures for what has happened and then how we've projected forward. Just be advised that there's no real way to project the total cost of the program because it is based on how many people apply. So let's say that we fall under the amazing grace that nobody in any of our schools has a community exposure and nobody takes care, um, nobody needs to be taken care of and nobody applies, we'd have zero expense. All right, thank you, Z. But we will get you the we will get you that data broken out. All right, Z, don't go don't get too comfortable over there. So the question was, uh, with regard to the original program, did it use dorm space? And yes, that's accurate. We used UNO, UNL, and UNK dorm space. Obviously, with the school year beginning, that space is no longer available. But that worked really well when early on we were dealing with uh, a lot of unknowns and we're looking, talking about people who are isolating. So since then, we've moved to a hotel model. And yes, it is still available for anybody who would need it. Uh, obviously, we don't have access to the dorm rooms. We'll still work with hotels. And is there Z, anything else I need to add to that? Nope. She's she's shaking her head back and forth. I got it right. <laughs> and Z's like, good. I don't have to go up there again. <laughs> Other questions? All right. I'm not seeing any other questions, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. But I want to. Again, thank our guests today who came in. Uh, well, Commissioner Bloom said you're here now, but uh, Commissioner Bloom said, Tim Myers, Jeannie Ewing, Angie Ling, uh, thank you very much for uh, being here today to help uh, talk about all the things that we're doing here in the state of Nebraska. And we will have, uh, again, I want to remind everybody again, all of our rules, still we're managing this virus, we're going to be managing this for the next coming months. So continue to keep that six foot distance between you and other people in public. Wear that mask when you go to the store. Wash your hands often. Avoid crowded, confined places, um, bars, restaurants, that sort of thing. Uh, sign up for testnebraska.com. And we will have our next press briefing tomorrow at 2.45 back here in this room. Thank you all very much, and have a great week. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>